doit passer au loin les oiseaux. Okay, then first a little bit from my side again. Um, the one thing I want to remind you, we talked at some stage about two approaches, meaning the one is an affirmative and the other is a critical approach. So the one is there just to solve problems, solving a problem as we have it now, as we face it now. And the other is a, a critical approach, which means as well, it aims on solving problems, but it is not the problem we have here and now, but it is the principal problem. Uh, so just alluding to this, you are playing with the phone, I can say there is one immediate solution, the problem, solving the problem, I take the phone away or I ask you to put it on the desk there. So that problem is solved. But a critical approach would say, why are you using the phone? It's not about just getting it out of the way now, but it is about solving the problem. Why are you using phones? Why are you not listening to me? Uh, what is the reason behind it? This would be problem solving in a long term version as well, but it would be critical about the current situation. And this is something we should keep in mind when it comes to law as well, that laws are of course there, and we have really come today to this, laws are there to solve an immediate problem here and now, but it is as well about developing perspective. And for this we have actually different laws, as I said, we uh, will come to this later. Uh, we have immediate legislation, the acts and bylaws, <coughs> and we have constitutions uh, that are outlining basically a strategy for the future. If you look at your own country, if you look at uh, anybody, uh, meaning any institution, you would have a constitution that is rarely changed, and then you have permanently changing uh, legislation, permanently changing uh, acts. So keep this in mind, please, when we are discussing the different legal instruments, and keep something in mind which I didn't uh, explicitly mention, but implicitly. Uh, there is one, to be honest, I don't know uh, if he was a lawyer or if he was any other uh, academic, um, writing about the history of the development of legislation of jurisprudence. And he came to this conclusion, it was really long-term history, uh, in one sentence mention, mentioning this, uh, it's a movement from status to contract. Meaning, in the original state, if something like this exists, we don't have really legislation. We have, for instance, a status by birth. If you are born as slave, this determines how you are treated, this determines which rights you have. And then there is something else, <clears throat> coming later, that actually status, this is his thesis, actually status doesn't matter. But what matters is what is written down in the uh, legislation, what is down, written down in a contract. Meaning your status, basically, is redefined by a contract, by strict legislation, if you want. So this is a very important thing. But, there's always a but, or usually a but, but there is another movement which I would call from static to movement, to context. Meaning you have written down these static rules of a law, 
And the law is somewhat static. You, you don't change it every day. So you have something written down, and yet then you can uh, you you come you um, come up not with the contract, but with the context and with context. You you renegotiate what it means. You have a general law, a contract, but then you try to figure out what what does it mean. You, you still use power. You still use your status. Uh, so. In general terms, again, you have this movement of, of jurisprudence uh, on the two sides, in the two ways. <clears throat> and I said as well, we are bound in legislation, in jurisprudence, uh, to moral settings, to moral settings, to social settings, to power relationships. Whatever is written down in the law, men are born free and equal, is not the entire truth, but as George Orwell said, uh, they are equal, but some are a little bit more equal than others. So you have to, or we have to deal with this, and this makes one point very important. And I read a little bit now. Um, I mentioned it already, uh, from a different text, and two quotes, we cannot discuss any of these rules in abstract terms. So my thesis is, and I'm not alone with it, but at the same time it is contesting much of human rights law, there is no such thing as human rights. Because humans are changing, Rights, our understanding of rights is changing. So how can we talk in abstract terms of human rights? What does it mean in concrete terms? And this is the question. And there we come to this distinction I mentioned in the beginning from affirmative, from problem solving, immediate problem solving solutions to a critical approach. As I said, I think last time, I hope that what we consider as human rights today will be hugely criticized in 200 years because it is so conservative, it is so exclusive, meaning it's excluding so many people, it's excluding so many rights that we think today are hugely progressive. Children's rights, we are discussing today about children's rights to include them as a fundamental rights, as human rights. Today I would say, this is ridiculous that we have to discuss it today. It's so obvious that children have rights. Now you can discuss if it's actually not already covered, and this is one discussion, if it's not already covered by the General Universal Declaration. Children are humans, human rights, so why do we need extra rights? But to say that children have rights that they did not have before, this is something I think extremely conservative, and I hope that we find A, this, or, or that we can take this A as confirmation, there is no such thing as an abstract right and at the same time that we, we will be further in the discussion on human rights uh, in 50 years, 100 years, or even 20 years. Now the quote, and it is a kind of famous fundamental discussion uh, or dispute between the, in, in the development of legislation, uh, Karl Marx on uh, George Frederick Hegel, Wilhelm Hegel, <clears throat> saying in a book he wrote in, I think, 1844, the political constitution is the organism of the state. All the organism of the state is the political constitution. So we have these two sides. That the various aspects of an organism stand to one another in a necessary connection arising out of the nature of the organism is sheer tautology. 
I cannot say, yes, of course, if you have a constitution, you have a, a state as well, uh, and vice versa. It doesn't really say anything. That if the political constitution is defined as an organism, the various aspects of the constitution, the various authorities, behave as organic features and stand to one another in rational relationship, is likewise autonomy. It is great advance to treat the political state as an organism and therefore to look upon the variety of authorities no longer as something inorganic but as a living and rational differentiation. So states, political institutions are not institutions that are kind of dead but they are living and they are used by different organizations, different institutions as United Nations, as national governments, as municipalities, and as uh, citizens. I will send this uh, later around as a quote, and uh, just one further thing. The same statement, <coughs> no, I have said nothing at all about the specific idea of the political constitution if I speak generally about the Constitution. The same statement can be made with the same truth about the animal as about the political organism. By what then is the animal organism distinguished from the political organism? By what? No. Uh, this cannot be deducted, deduced uh, from this general definition but an explanation which does not provide the differentia specifica is no explanation. Meaning, if I explain something without saying that is specific to this and that person, this is specific to this and that item, I don't say anything. I do not define anything. It depends, of course, on what I want, what is important in this moment, but if I say uh, you are a human being and you are a human being, it does not say anything about from where you come. If you say, if I say you are a human being and you are a human being, it does not say anything about gender. So it is the need of some specification to say something, now I can say I mean you and not you. There is a difference between it. There's a difference between an organism of an animal and a political institution. And now this important point here, in terms of legislation, in terms of law, the sole interest of Hegel, the sole interest is in rediscovering the idea, pure and simple, the logical idea in every element, whether of the state or of nature, and the actual subjects in this case, the political constitution uh, come to be uh, nothing but their mere names. Meaning, when we talk about legislation, we are talking about something that has a certain purpose. We are not talking about general rights and general obligations, but we are talking about something where we say, this is the purpose of it. We want to emancipate individuals. We want to improve their material, socio-economic situation. Or we want to improve the living situation of groups. This makes a difference when we come to the decision on, uh, or, or to the discussion on what exactly rights means. And one reason why this, important, why, why this is important to go from the abstract to the concrete, one important reason is that legislation in general I'm not talking about human rights now, this uh, is a specific uh, case, 
but that legislation in general is concerned, and we have been talking about it, with limitations. Any law, any legislation, nearly any, has one content, there we are actually in a way, in an abstract level, it is limiting what people are allowed to do. Because there is this conflict between different groups and the interest of one and the interest of the other are standing in contradiction. The interest of the murder with the axe in front of the house is I want to know where this guy is and kill him. The interest of the friend and of course of the potential victim is surviving. So I limit the freedom of this guy standing there with the axe. And then we are in conflict. Are we limiting the freedom as well of the person who stands there and has to tell a lie? Should we say no, no lies at all? Or should we say no lies at all, but under certain conditions it is possible? So, the one limitation in general terms is self-protection or protection of somebody, something that is weak. And the other is what is called in different terms the common, the general interest. There is a general interest that not everybody can run around with an axe and kill everybody uh, if he wants to. And then of course we have with this as well the decision, are we protecting, are we uh, limiting individuals or are we limiting the social, the society or social groups? And then we have another point we mentioned, where I said there is something about justification. Why can we do it? Can we just say there is a common interest and, and that's the reason why we can uh, limit some action or is there something else? The one I said is correction. the correction of certain behavior as it occurred. The other is a compensation. If there is a disadvantage in this setting of everybody is born free and equal, but there is something for whatever reason that makes it impossible, we have a compensation uh, for this behavior. And then we have as a Lasting, if you want, the securitization. Meaning, making sure that really everybody can achieve the same status, the same thing, even if the conditions are different. Securing as well diversity. And then, of course, you have these kind of funny things where you have a decision to take um, and where you have to discuss and where you have to negotiate. Um, I was recently approached for an interview. Um, we are coming from the women's university or female university. 
So there is a university simply there where only young women can go. But you can say, of course, this is not diversity because you have only one society group. But then you can say as well, because of a disadvantage in another area, you have this positive discrimination, as it is called, making it possible for women to have their, in a way, protected area where they can develop and unfold themselves in a setting that is otherwise not given. Mind, if you go through universities and look at the different subjects, some, you can say, it's kind of equal. 50%, 50% in terms of uh, distribution of, of gender. There are other subjects where you can go into the classroom, you have 95% male students, and other subjects you can go into the classroom and have 95% female students. Um, <clears throat> of course, different from country to, to country, uh, different from, from city to city as well, from different things, but it is something that is remarkable where we have to think not in formal terms of law, because in formal terms equality means equality, the same rule for the same people in the same subject. But it is about substance, it is about what do we want to achieve under certain conditions. And these conditions are not as they ought to be in a paradise, a garden of Eden or whatever, but they are given uh, in very concrete terms. And then of course it means as well that we have to think about what does it actually mean uh, talking about rights. And today we have a certain understanding of what it means, um, especially when it comes then to profession like uh, law. But I said, even if we did not talk about human rights in ancient times or in older times, there had been some kind of notion uh, of right in terms of this is wrong and we want to correct it, we want that people behave in the right way, in a correct way, morally correct. <clears throat> then I have this quote here from 1381, a rebel leader. It was not slavery, mind. They had played something as well. We are called serves and beaten if you are slow in our service. And yet we do not have anybody to go to, to complain. So we just go to the king hoping that the king is there and will help us. And otherwise we will simply go onto the barricades and take our better treatment. We claim it, in fact. So it was not about written laws or, or anything like this, but it was this moral claim, we are human beings, we are serves, fine, but still we deserve respect. And this respect means that we have some body, some institutional system, which today is the state, where we need a system, another funny term, general term, too general, but where we need a system of regulation where it is not moving on on its own, but where we need a body that regulates this. 
These are, of course, nation states, but it's as well about, for instance, the United Nations. Whatever the United Nations is, in terms of a legal body, of an institution, of an institution that has power, but it is an institution that regulates something. And there are two tangible, tangible lines and these are on the one hand the one I mentioned just before between individual and social and this social is a tricky thing, it can be society, it can be groups, interest groups, it can be groups uh, of people who are living in a certain, um, under certain conditions or with certain, with certain conditions, being disabled. I just mentioned before women uh, who are under, or in, in certain uh, dis, uh, societies still hugely discriminated uh, where they need quotas, for instance, that's one supposed solution. And this is actually leading on to the other one. Uh, it is informal and formal. If there's any conflict here in the classroom immediately, kind of smallish conflict, we can solve this amongst ourselves. It's kind of between individuals, we can say or find a solution and say, well, please stop this or, or can you, what's it? Now, if this escalates, we need at some stage possibly a formal solution and say, this is a permanent behavior. The teacher permanently offending us disrespecting us, and even if we talk to him, to her, this person doesn't listen, doesn't change the behavior, so we go, I don't know to whom to go, uh, finally to the dean or to, I don't know what, and he would just not throw me out of the window, but throw me out of the job. So this would be a formal regulation uh, that is a completely different thing uh, as the informal. Now, I wrote that individual and uh, informal, social and formal. It does not mean that you have uh, these lines. You may have something individual as well being regulated formally, and you may have as well so on the social society level something being regulated informally. Uh, but these are two tangential lines that are important for something that comes later then, where somebody came up, Chun and Light preached to them, to put the names, with truly. Meaning, today, there is at least one institutional system that has a clear definition that is clearly defined. Now, mind if a so social scientist, whatever kind, says clearly it is not really clear uh, in total terms. But where we have truly, which is the T for the territory. We talked about the Westphalian peace, where states decided this is the border and you have to respect this territory. You have to respect this is your country, this is the border of your country, and this is it. <coughs> so the territory, territory uh, state. And this stage has, of course, different tasks. And one of the tasks is executed, or the instrument of it, 
is, of course, exciting all of us. The rule of law. Meaning, the state on the one hand, Max Weber, is an instance that has a kind of overall power. The state can say, sorry, you go to prison. I cannot lock you up. The state can. I cannot kill you. The state can. But, under certain conditions, and these are defined in the rule of law. Meaning, you have to be, uh, be, uh, behave in a certain way, or there have to be certain conditions that the state is in a position, is allowed to do one or the other. It can, for instance, lock you up to protect you. Because if you are not in prison, somebody will definitely chase you and uh, kill you. No, it does not mean locking you up in prison, but at least taking you into custody. As I mentioned before, custody, uh, if, if, you, if you ruin yourself, if, if I know you will kill yourself, suicide, uh, taking an overdose of drugs or whatever, I can say, well, there are two options. The one, leave you go with it, I know tomorrow or next week you're dead, or I will take care of you if you, if you want or not. I will do it. Just, but there has to be a rule of law that the state as well has to, protect, uh, to, to observe. Forget you. It is then a democratic state. Again, democracy doesn't mean anything. You have different forms of democracy. But at least the idea is of the modern nation state, the territorial state based on the rule of law, is there is a democratic rule. It can be elections, it can be plebiscites, it can be different things, but there is some idea of uh, democracy. And very important as well when it comes to law, it is an intervention, interventive state. It does something. It provides welfare services. It provides streets. It provides education. And it says as well, this is another form of intervention, yes, you can, but you cannot, for whatever reason. For whatever reason means, of course, not really for whatever reason, but it is bound, uh, based on, on the, uh, the idea of rule of law. So this is a framework with which you can understand better that whatever we are facing is not an individual measure. But it is a system, it is a systematic set of measures where different things are working together. At least this should be the case. And then we come back to Marx, to the, what I quoted before, this organic system. This organic system is a different one from one country to another. And we have to know on the one hand the more or less general rules, and then we have to know as well the specific ones. Why is this important as well when it comes, for instance, this is a brief thing we'll talk later, uh, we'll talk next time, 
more intensively about it, uh, human rights. We have this general, really very general understanding of um, saying something stupid. You, you don't eat your children. But at the same time, we have more specific things. Why do we say this today? Why do we have children in completely different status than they have had uh, 100 years ago or 50 years ago? And this is not necessarily, this is not about eating children, but the status of children <clears throat> in different societies. That in some societies you have one child, not because the law says it, but because this is the standard. In other countries you have plenty of children. And especially then in during, uh, different periods of, uh, in history. Because children at some stage had been the social security for old age. Meaning many children meant you have had many people to support you. Now very roughly in a nutshell you can say if we have a state pension system why should I have so many children? At least I would not have them as a measure of social security. So we have rights in this very general uh, form of, of human rights, if you want, going down to national to international uh, uh, legislation, to international rights, which is different from global, because the global is really all encompassing. The international would be um, rights that are regulated uh, between Laos and, and, and Vietnam. Who has the right to travel under which conditions in terms of uh, social security? What happens if you travel from Laos to Vietnam or the other way around with social security? This is internationally regulated. There is no overall uh, legislation for this. And then you have, of course, the different laws and exercises uh, sometimes or usually on the um, on the local municipalities. And then you have the general rules of that we I only mentioned for, 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 to be complete there. there uh, we have the philosophical, we have the economic ways of thinking during a certain time uh, that enlighten, enlightenment came up, that a uh, certain economic revolution came up uh, and a political uh, uh, revolution as well. Um, so th these are general trends. Um, we have to keep them in mind, but this is the background, if you want, uh, for what then is happening in terms of really concrete <coughs> legislation. Concrete legislation as well, as Hannah Arendt said, um, it is about the right to have rights. And then I come back to this one. The right to have rights, you need an instance that guarantees it. I cannot guarantee your right I cannot guarantee your right for education. Microsoft, Bill Gates, Alibaba cannot guarantee your right for education or some enterprise from your country. But the states are in this position. You can go to the state and say, this is my right, and it is written down in the Constitution. It is, or it had been negotiated, and this gives me the right to have rights. This gives me an instance where I can go to the state and say, listen, 
you deny my right, you are responsible to provide health service, you are responsible as a state uh, to provide education, you are responsible, what you said uh, at some stage, um, you are responsible to secure the road and put up signs if there's a problem with the road and if you do not do it, whatever it means in concrete terms, then I can claim repair, I can claim uh, reputation, uh, uh, compensation. This is important in terms of establishing a system of rights, meaning we have this general movement of individual laws. Now somebody decides in this case, this and that is the rule at least, to a system of law with the three pillars, if you want, The one is the law making. Somebody has to sit down and make a law. It's not falling from heaven. It's not growing out of the ground. And of course, as I said a couple of times, occasionally, frequently, it is a matter of conflict. There are potentially at least different interests involved. And these different interests are a matter of norms. Meaning from where do or, or we, we define law, we, we define draw up acts by way of having a certain norm. You ought to be is always playing a role when it comes to new um, legislation. Not smoking. There's an ought to be. Why should we not smoke? There's a norm. And actually the background for not smoking is a different one from country to country. If you have this law, some people say protect the children, some people say protect the co-worker, and some people say protect the health insurance. So I have different rationale behind it and different norms, different normative system. And this, of course, most importantly, so that's a special color, It is about production, it is about the economy. And whatever economic system we have, this determines strongly, influences strongly uh, what it means, why we orient towards a certain law. I said at some stage or last time we, we talked about this, uh, property rights. The right to be economically active. Again, under certain conditions. And walk along the street and just sometimes think about what is actually the law behind it. What is, if somebody stands there, there is an elderly woman standing every morning very early, uh, here on the pedestrian way, um, she does a small business. I don't know what she sells. Uh, she has a scale there, one of these old fashioned things, and she sells something. Is it a registered business, or is it a business where she just does it and nobody catches her because everybody knows this is a poor woman? Just leave her, she doesn't do any harm. Um, so production, and then of course you have a production, this in 
in a more organized way, in a more complex way. And I thought about it uh, here again, um, moving back to China. We always talk in economics about large enterprise. We talk about, for instance, in, in the context here with, with China, about uh, the production of Apple phones and all this. If you look at the amount of small shops, of small production sites, of craftswork, it is amazing. Now, coming to halal food, I don't know how large this is, but it is definitely small if compared with IKEA, who has a food section. And even the food section of IKEA, which is a furniture selling supermarket or whatever, this is larger, I guess, than halal food. So still they coexist and they depend on each other in one way or another on the level of, of, of the macroeconomic development. And this, of course, defines as well what the law looks like. Having mentioned IKEA, I don't know, they have this stupid thing here in, in Shanghai. Uh, I, I don't know how large it is, but they opened a shop in Ireland. And in Ireland, at that stage, when, uh, at that time when they wanted to open, there was a limitation to shop sizes. And IKEA said, well, sorry, this size is just ridiculous. We need a larger shop. We need, I don't know how many square meters. So what the Irish government did at the time was changing the law in order to allow IKEA to settle there, to open the shop. Which, of course, meant you have to open then for all other companies as well opening large shops. If you want, you can say the opening of IKEA in Ireland was the opening of a new age in terms of uh, large shops, large outlets. So this is important to keep in mind that you had the law making, somebody sitting down and making the law. Politicians and lawyers thinking about what kind of law do we have already, limiting the shop size to, I don't know, about 100 square meters. Now what do we need, what have, do we have to make to have larger shops? But somebody comes here saying, sorry, we want a larger shop. With 100 square meter, we, we just don't come. And the norm at the stage was Ireland needed employment. So you would have this step of Ireland needs employment, gets an offer by IKEA, IKEA, we come, but under the condition that we have a large shop and then you would have a new law. This is simplified, admittedly, but it is, in a way, how it really works. And then you have this kind of legislation in different areas. I said we have a law on shop, uh, on, on shop size, we have a law on what does it mean for uh, people working there, um, what does it mean for dress codes, possibly? Uh, so you have a variety of, the, uh, of, of regulations there. You have something that is going beyond, that is going beyond as well in terms. What does it mean um, in terms of social security system, of health provision, of traffic? How much car park do they need? So you have a variety of laws in different areas. 
And then you say, at some stage, of course not on, on this level, no, but in a way, at some stage you say, this is chaotic. We have so many different laws. Actually, we have to do something with it. And this is an overall codification. Making sense that they are working together. In the best known way, it is a code civil that really encompasses the entire legislation of a country and puts, not literally, sometimes as well, literally puts all the different legislation into one place, harmonizes it. There's this stupid joke, um, <clears throat> you know, in Ireland, you drive on the um, left side of the car, different to Europe, to the rest of Europe, but the UK as well. So somebody had, had the idea of, um, we are the only, nearly the only country where people drive on the left side, which is a little bit of nuisance. We, we should harmonize this with the other countries. So what do we do? We first try it with the tracks. And if this works, that they drive on the right side. If this works, we try it with the buses. And if the buses work as well on the right side, then we try it with the cars. Which is, of course, stupid, nonsense. Uh, but it shows exactly this point. You, you have to harmonize it from the beginning. You have to say, A, uh, yeah, A, all vehicles drive on the left side or all on the right side. Because Ireland was a different country, you could say, okay, they can drive as, what, as, as they want, but in Europe, in mainland Europe, they still have to adapt it to the others. So codification, harmonization, putting things into, into place, sometimes literally into one legal place, into one code book. And this encompasses substance, and process. And if you go to court, if you observe what, happen, what is happening there, you see not only the negotiation of a case where somebody murdered somebody else, but you see as well a certain process, who has the right to speak when, who needs, who can have a solicitor, what solicitor can this be, do you have a right for, for translation, or do you have to look for translation yourself. So this is procedural law as well, and it is very important. There had been this famous first codification, um, the Legis Duidicin, Tabulara, um, the, 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 the Roman uh, Twelve Tables. This was a kind of first attempt to bring different legislation together. And it happened then frequently during history again and again, where in most of the countries, as far as I am informed, you have certain codes and what you have, and we only uh, deal with this, although we shouldn't. Um, you have positive law. We mentioned it, I won't go into detail again. Uh, it is a man-made law, it is written law, it is a codification uh, that actually commands something. This is important, it is a command law, 
it says this is what you have to do. It's not rights law, although there are rights involved, but it is not defining your rights, but it is um, defining your obligations. If you A, then Z, or then one. If you uh, smoke, then you have to leave the room and do it outside of the building. It does not say you have the right to smoke outside of the building, but it says if you want to smoke, then leave the building. It's a tiny difference, but it is a very important difference uh, in terms of legislation. Coming back to the quote, quotes from the dispute with Hegel, it is concrete means as well <coughs> these laws, constitutions especially, come from somewhere. It's a power game, it's a historical game, they are not invented from the stretch, but it is at the same time some constitutional process where you have actually different powers, different interest groups, kind of fighting, struggling, hearing, struggling for this should be the law of the country from now on. Of course, when it comes to a new country, after a, world, after a war or something, you have this dispute, or you have it at some stage uh, in between uh, when people think now it's time to change something because of the social structure change, because of the, uh, the, the international position change or whatsoever. What we have, I said, it's, con it's a constitution. It's not a contract. Sometimes it is called actually the social contract. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I mentioned this, uh, with, with uh, Hobbes. But legally, in, in terms of, of terminology, it is wrong. It is not a contract. It is not people sitting together, obliging each other. This is a contract. We draw up a contract, and we say, in the case of ABC, this is the rule. Usually, in terms of exchange, obliging both sides to something. Payment, for instance, against the delivery of a service of a good. The Constitution is different there. It sets a, an entire framework, meaning as well that it is really not concrete, that it is a framework in which action then can be defined. What you usually have is the general framework in the first part of the Constitution. This is a very broad normative system. You should not break your fingers when you do this, but you can do it as long as you don't break them. Um, but then comes the more concrete part, the second part, really, sometimes the third part, which actually says, uh, in concrete terms, describes the certain conditions under, some, under uh, which something happens. It is, as I said, it's not a contract, important. And then you have, of course, the Constitution and the treaty. Again, something different. And one important part of the distinction is the long-term orientation uh, against the, the short-term. Uh, orientation. 
Contracts are, in the extreme case, they are for one single case. I give you this piece of paper and you return it after the lesson, or I, you can keep this paper, but you have to pay me one euro. Something like this, and this is only for this situation here and now. Um, a constitution treaty would then say, uh, the teachers have to provide papers to the students against payment or whatever then. But, but this is then for the semester or for this university also. Uh, it is important, is, it is of course as well dealing with rights, but it is as well setting basically a, a rule for Two, two parties, and that is this magic thing of the state, of this institutional system of truly, and its citizens. Who is responsible for you or for us? here in China. What is the role of the Chinese state? Because we are not Chinese citizens. The easy thing is, well, the one thing is the Chinese state, the other is our national state, whichever passport we have. But then you have the Chinese state saying, sorry, you are not allowed simply to enter our territory and do whatever you want for your people. So that is then complicated, or actually not too complicated, because then you have the embassies of your country and the embassy in your, of, of your country is actually part of the territory of your country. That is international rule that the embassy of your country in China, the embassy of Laos in Vietnam, uh, or in France, or in Germany, or whatever, is extraterritorial, is belonging to your country and not to the country where they settle. And this is part of international law that actually says, okay, we have this provision for certain countries um, and we have this as another set of legislation that is international law regulating the um, the relationship between two, uh, different countries. It may be two countries, it may be different countries. Uh, for instance, you have the ASEAN uh, um, group, you have the European Union, um, you have actually quite a lot of groups, uh, international groups, uh, that have a, a certain fixed um, relationship to each other, where we have rights of the different countries um, regulated, not in treaties, but this would be then international uh, law of which the United Nations regulation is part. And I say the United Reg uh, Nations regulation because in strict sense we do not have human rights law in the understanding of the Conventions in the understanding of the United, um, the Universal Declaration of Human, Human Rights, these are not legislative acts in the strict sense. So this is something for next time. And I'll stop here now, and we can continue after a short break with your homework. Aux 
aux yeux de lumière Qui voit passer au loin les oiseaux Comme l'oiseau bleu survolant la terre Voit comme le monde, le monde est beau 